Hello and welcome back to theCUBE's live coverage coming to you from RSAC here in San Francisco. We are talking all things security and AI and compliance and all those exciting things. So, and today I'm joined by my colleague Dave Vellante, also David Linthicum, and we are joined for our conversation today by Harold Rivas, who's the CISO of Trellix. Welcome, it's so great to have you. Thank you Thanks so much on. for having me, Pre appreciate Absolutely. that. Absolutely, so talk with us a little bit about Trellix. So Trellix is a global cybersecurity company. Uh, I lead the program, internal program, but I also get to connect with our customers worldwide. It's a very large enterprise, supporting multiple vectors, multiple industries, including some of the largest militaries in the world. Oh, very cool. Well, you have some, you know, a big announcement that you made here at RSAC was some research that you published, and I love, I love your concept here. So it's getting into the mind of the CISO, decoding the Gen AI impact, which is on every person's mind today. Um, you know, and, and I love that your subtitle was the CISO's perspective of Gen AI, the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Okay, <laughs> come on, lay it on us. Well, I think we, we really at are at the precipice of a major, major disruption in our industry. Yeah. We have both an opportunity and a risk, right? We have an opportunity to dramatically improve the efficiency of security operations teams out there. But we're also confronted with the fact that our bad actors are going out there, mobilizing, getting organized, and finding new and effective ways to attack organizations. So there is quite a bit of an arms race, we're absolutely making the investments we're looking at and have recently released capabilities that we think will help those operators and it's only the beginning. We're going to continue to double down and find new and optimized ways to help those defenders because they need it. Well we have to. You know, as an industry, we have to, right? And we talk about this a lot. The threat actors are deeply motivated. Um, this is, you know, their motivation to learn all things related to Gen AI is probably greater than the rest of ours simply because there's money at the end of that rainbow. So, you know, we don't, there's no time to waste. There are a lot of questions to answer. And so it is a really challenging time for customers. And what are, what are you hearing, you know, really what's top of mind for your CISO customers as you're having these conversations? Yes, at, at, at the end of the day, I think we're all confronted with the reality that it is here and it is here to stay. Uh, so the challenges for CISOs are not only what are the bad actors doing to mobilize and how do I keep an eye on what I don't know about their new capabilities, but what is my enterprise doing and how do I effectively govern this new capability? What are the right steps to influence the organization while of course the, what I like to say is the role of the CISO is still being written. It's not totally clear to many organizations exactly where and how to leverage a CISO. I think CISOs everywhere should be leaning into this as an opportunity to define themselves as an enabler of the business, as someone who can really transform the business, while at the same time benefiting from the fact that they then get to manage the risk more effectively. So for, for CISOs everywhere, I think we're all really concerned, uh, but I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic about, of course, where I sit, I get to see how defenders are mobilizing, how we're taking steps to try and make the fight stronger for the defenders. So it is one of these things where we will have to wait and see a little bit and just see how, how those creative actors get to work. Harold, I could, I could have this conversation with you and if you told me you're the CIO, <laughs> I would say, oh, yep, yeah. makes sense what you're saying, that resonates with me. It's, it, you know, there's an age-old debate, where should the CISO report? You know, they shouldn't report to the CIO, that's the fox in the hen house situation, that should be the CEO or whatever. But I do see those roles coming together. In fact, there's some companies, CISO and the CIO are one role, like Snowflake is an example. That's Sunny, right. Sunny Betty uh, is an example. Um, what struck me in this survey is a couple things. One is Gen AI has improved the productivity of the workforce by an average of 38%, according to the CISOs. I'm inferring that's not a SecOps specific figure, that's in, in, in company wide. That's right. As you said, focus on the business, connecting to the business. First of all, that's, you're confirming that's the case. Mm -hmm. Second of all, that's a huge number. That's right. Um, where do you think that comes from? I think that efficiencies, it's a really fascinating component of what Gen AI is bringing to the table in that it, really allows that knowledge worker to that 
capability to be distilled into a set of processes and techniques that can then, of course, be automated. So we will see massive disruption across multiple markets. This is just the beginning. I think that that 38% is really low. I think we're over the next 12, 24, 36 months, we're going to continue to see that number increase. As organizations look at how do I best deploy this capability, where is it going to be the most disruptive, and of course, what are my competitors doing that are getting accelerated benefits from these capabilities? So for us, we're going to look at knowledge work and find ways that we can accelerate. There's a concept of a 10x developer in the technology world. The idea that there are specialized individuals that have far excessive capabilities relative to their peers. Why don't we have 10x accountants, 10x lawyers, 10x you name it? Because those capabilities just, I don't think, have been there. I think that Gen AI will create that construct, the yeah. idea of this person is just 10 times more efficient, more effective than their peer. It's interesting you say that number is low. We were at, um, I think it was the UiPath show, Shelley, uh, last October. Eric Brynjolfsson, who's an MIT professor, CUBE alum, uh, author of The Second Machine Age with uh, Andy McAfee, said he'd be disappointed if the productivity numbers didn't double from say 2% to 4% globally. Right. As a, as a direct right. result of Gen AI. So that would you know, put this 38% to shame, to your point. The mm -hmm. other thing that stood out was a significant portion of the CISOs, over 92%, or 90%, 92% actually, said the critical need for sector-specific Gen AI adoption strategies to address unique vulnerabilities. So two things going on there. It fits the Gen AI power law that we developed a couple years ago, which talked about domain-specific Gen AI. And so there's two pieces there. One is the business, applying Gen AI for very specific, maybe they're smaller language models, but also di bringing different security re requirements. I wonder if you could elaborate. I, absolutely, happy to. I think that as, as common, we had an interesting, fascinating set of conversations over dinner last night with a variety of different sector CISOs. We found how common our challenges are. But when you really start to dig into it, the technologies and the capabilities that enable a business uh, a water treatment system, for example, as opposed to, let's say, a set of ATMs, there are going to be very discrete and unique pieces of capabilities that are enabled through each one of these. And those operators, those people living and breathing the defense of those organizations, business resilient objectives of those organizations, are well versed in that. They understand that what's true for Gen AI, for knowledge workers, let's say, is going to be different if you're talking about a hospital system where I can't go and deploy new capabilities overnight. So the sector specific construct I think is really important. We need to think about how it's going to impact each organization and therefore introduce capabilities, guidance for that specific industry. I think that's a really important call out. I wonder if I could ask you about the cultural impacts of that. When I think about water treatment systems and critical infrastructure, these are systems that are generally run by engineers, mm -hmm. not IT people. We've talked yeah. a lot this week about the IT and the OT convergence. How do you think about, from a CISO perspective, of bringing those two worlds together so that that's not friction, so that you can get, align them for the, for the objectives? Are there cultural tips, tricks, you know, best practices that you'd advise? I, I certainly would encourage CISOs everywhere that if it's within your organization's scope, start to get curious about it. And I think it's happening. Yeah. At, at earlier points in our trajectory, we were focused on our corporate security and protecting employees, and someone else was worried about making sure those systems ran. Of course, with operational technology risks, we are understanding with hospital system ransomware cases, we're understanding that all of these systems can be leveraged towards bad actors' objectives. In our keynote, uh, our CEO and myself covered space as a new vector that CISOs or CISOs are approaching day in and day out. This is effectively the new domain, a new area of focus. So, as the role is still unwritten, we're going to continue to expand our understanding of what are the techniques and methods we need to employ to protect those capabilities. Land, air, sea, space, and then cyber is orthogonal th throughout That's right. it. And now we have the sixth the private sector, us, yes. right? right? Which is a new domain of warfare. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. um, what are you seeing 
amongst your colleagues on budgets. Average, our, our numbers and our partner ETR, average IT budget's increasing about mid threes, call it three and a half percent yes. this year. The security budgets are increasing much faster, probably 3X. Yes. Um, what, what are you seeing? Is that sort of a line? It, it, it is. What I would say is that this is the age old challenge of you know, compression, IT budgets, reduction in IT budgets, and then needing to advocate separately, creating the right kinds of relationships to understand that while IT budgets might sometime need to compress as a function of market forces, the risk oftentimes it's only going up. Right. So having a platform to have the conversation with your boards, with your executive committee, that allows for you to recognize that the threats are not reducing, it's only getting worse, and therefore special carve outs for dedicated security budgets are going to be needed. But yes, very much in line with what I'm seeing. We, with our partners ETR, we did a piece of research prior to RSA, just to get a sense, and it was not a huge end, it was 321 respondents, CISOs, half of which you're attending, and the question was in the next 12 months, are you going to increase or you know, decrease or stay the same the number of vendors in your security stack? And we were, we're not surprised that the number was increasing. We were a little surprised that it was 51% said it was increasing, yeah. and only 9% said it was decreasing. And of those, only 6% only in the total survey said decreasing is a specific, um, uh, consolidation is a specific uh, approach to decreasing the number of vendors. Does right. any of that surprise you? No, not at all. I think that if I look at it as an operator, I've, I have a career that's 25 years in the making now, largely in financial services. One of the th realities is we're all focused now on undoing our own mess. We've gone in and deployed countless capabilities, point solutions over the course of a decade plus. Right, we had an identity problem, we deployed an identity solution. We had a phishing problem, we deployed a phishing solution. Managing all of that, 70 to 80 different products is a nightmare for yeah. CISOs because you need to retain technology capable resources that know how to deal with those products. Right. So for us, looking at a consolidation play is going to be absolutely essential to gaining efficiencies, to gaining quicker responses, that's where we see the market going, that's why Trellix is really strategically oriented towards that platform. And is play. that what you see on average, you know, 70 to 80 tools installed in these large companies? In my last organization, I had 73. So it is, wow. it is spot on, and we've surveyed over 500 CISOs worldwide. It's remarkably consistent. Uh, your, your data, I think, also points to a, a couple of underlying factors. Um, depending on where in the world you are, there's varying maturity uh, and understanding of cyber risk. Uh, across Latin America, I think there's an increasing awareness. There's some governments that are certainly making appropriate uh, efforts in this regard. But what we have seen is the absence of legal frameworks right. and guidance has created a real difficulty for CISOs because if they don't have some external force, there's a single voice in that executive room saying, we really need to recognize this risk. And it's, it's really a, a difficult thing. So I've seen some areas where those numbers might be higher, depending on where you are. Perhaps Asia Pac, perhaps Latin America. It might be you know, a higher number of individuals that are seeing their budgets decrease. We're going to double click on that, because we actually do have, you, know, you can't slice the salami too much in these smaller surveys. Uh, what about the age old debate because we, we went back to these folks and said, well, why? Yeah. Why are you increasing? They said, two reasons. One is, we need more tools to fill the gaps. And second, which is related, is we got to have best of breed. Is that true from a CISO's perspective? Stepping back, do you need best of breed? Do you need that, I, I must say shiny new toy, it sounds like a pejorative. <laughs> I don't mean it as a pejorative, but you know what I'm, I mean. I absolutely know what you <laughs> I mean. I feel like you've been asked this question before. <laughs> no, it's just, <laughs> it's the reality I've lived. Yeah. And, and I can now see CISOs step into an organization, evaluate the program, and make determinations about what do I need, what's been successful in the past, and how do I get there. If you've done that a couple of times over, what you find is, I need the glass of milk, I don't need the cow, I don't need all the capability. I need a control that works and is consistent. It can be best of breed, it cannot, but ultimately it needs to deliver a consistent capability for me so that I can move on and focus on other areas of my overall responsibilities. The desire to go and 
selectively identified the very best tool in each possible category, I think is something that is eroding as CISOs really are challenged with. Now how am I going to support that, right? How do I have the resources always aligned for this incredible mix of capabilities. This is what's giving rise to this recognition. We need platforms, we need things that work consistently, work well together. That's the only way we can fight this fight because CISOs are taking their eye off of day-to-day -day operational activities to focus on how is the legal and regulatory landscape changing? How do I influence my board? Yeah. How do I have the right conversation about budgets? They cannot be spending their days focused on do I have the right person to run this particular tool day in, day out. But how hard is it to change? So, you know, if we have adopted this practice, it's almost like I, I did an event a couple weeks ago that was a, a composable commerce focused event, right? And, and composable commerce, the, the theory there makes a lot of sense. You can just plug in the units that you need mm -hmm. and it's quick to scale and mm -hmm. quick to deploy and all that is music to everyone's ears, right? So it seems like a little bit of what we've done thus far is kind of a composable mm -hmm. pro, uh, approach to our cybersecurity architecture mm -hmm. and, and our stack. And But how difficult is it when we've got those 70 different tools plugged in, how difficult is it to say, oh, we're going to shift to a platform? Yeah. I mean, that seems like it could be it, a, it a daunting challenge. It, it, it can can be depending on the organizational dynamics. I'll, I'll admit that because oftentimes across those 70 products, you might have a variety of different stakeholders. You might have ind individual constituents that need to be consulted, right? So from an implementation strategy perspective, but I would say that CISOs have an imperative. Ultimately, coming back to that glass of milk, what I'm after is how do I contain that risk as quickly as possible? How do I reduce the number of alerts that my team has to deal with? So there is a carrot on the other side of fighting through consolidation, reduction, and simplification of my portfolio so that I can have fewer individuals that are highly specialized, highly trained on those capabilities on that platform as opposed to having somebody who just focuses on one of those 72, 73 different products. Yeah, right? well that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Well, Harold, Harold Rivas, CISO of Trellix, thank you so much for hopping on theCUBE today. It's been great having you. I'm great sure this you. is the first of many conversations that we'll have. And for our viewing and listening audience, thanks for joining us here at RSAC in San Francisco. Keep it on theCUBE for all the news coming out of this event.